microglia and bacilli. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and it's all, all together, it's just a mind boggling number of cells. Yet, go ahead. All good? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Did I? Sorry. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I got it. Okay. <laughs> um, as I said, uh, this is this is incredible. The fact that this sort of can even happen in one individual, yet it very reproducibly happens, pretty much, uh, you know, largely. Let's say uh, about twenty births uh, a minute world, while despite our differences in environment, the conditions of birth, etc. So we have this very robust assembly instructions intrinsically encoded uh, in the, uh, you know. In, in the in the this developmental programs that that underlies human brain assembly and just like many other species um you know the human human brain uh, development starts with the formation of the closure of the neural tube humans around at, at around four weeks uh, post conception but then unlike other species uh there's a lot of these processes that are triggered right after this neural tube closure that, ha that have to be coordinated over very long periods of time. Uh, and for example, things like neurogenesis migration can happen mostly in utero. Uh, at the same time, things like synaptogenesis, myelination, synaptic pruning, mostly happens uh, right after birth. So it's a very long time for millions and billions of cells to be coordinated uh, under the strict uh, schedules. Um, so we know that basically the, all of this to say that human brain uh, development is complicated. Um, uh, and a lot of our sort of insights about how this process has happened come from either things like fMRI studies, uh, where we really don't have the resolution to go all that deep beyond the, the regional resolutions, or postmortem studies with our sort of this terminal static snapshots of what's happening at very specific time points. Um, um, and so basically, this is to say that uh, a lot of the a lot of this the insights that we've got uh, from uh, about human brain development it, it really lacks a functional perspective. In that we just because we lack access to this to this tissue at, at a functional state, we really are unable to historically study. The, the rules of this assembly and the, and the mechanistic in, uh, sort of like underpinnings of this human brain assembly at this uh, molecular, cellular, and circuit levels. Um, and this is sort of the primary motivation of a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about today. Um, in 2012-ish, um, Shinya Yamanaka and, and colleagues um, sort of came up with the way that really blossomed this, uh, this field of pluripotent stem cells and was really a, an answer to this challenge of uh, not having access to uh, to this very important stages of human brain development. Uh, and these were, uh, these were, as I said, uh, um, uh, uh, human, what's called human in this and stem cells. Uh, and these were basically stem cells that were generated from uh, somatic cells of individuals uh, that that were basically generated through overexpression of these factors that were later named Yamanaka factors after Shinya Yamanaka, and what what the overexpression did was to uh, revert the developmental state back for these cells, so that they basically assumed uh, going from a fully somatic differentiated state to a de-differentiated pluripotent state, where they were able to. Uh, uh, sort of, they retain the capacity to then differentiate it, to be differentiated into other cell types. And uh, let, let the, the, the sort of the second state, so there was a lot of work that, that was done uh, gen generating very homogeneous cell types using this protocol. People made very homogeneous motor neuron populations, GABAergic populations, uh, uh, other glutamatergic populations. Uh, but then the second wave of this human IPSC derived models came from these three dimensional models, where instead of patterning a cell type, people started thinking about patterning regions. Uh, 
Um, and this is this is sort of uh, uh, that what the pipe the pipeline looks like, where once you have the stem cells, you can sort of dissociate them, put them in this micro wells, um, and then you know this takes about twenty four hours, and then they form this three dimensional balls of stem cells, basically. And just using this is the critical step here, just using this uh, patterning mo molecules uh, that. I will tell you a little bit more about later. Uh, we can sort of direct the fate of this uh, of these three dimensional cultures into very specific regional fates. Um, and you know, one of the first papers that came out of the Pascal lab was uh, how to generate um, this, this cortical spheroids that I will I will I will talk about in a little bit. Uh, but this is to say that this this technology really was developed to, to bridge that gap between us having a, sort of this clinical level understanding of how the human brain develops uh, and, and just this huge gap towards knowing what's going on at the cellular and molecular levels. Um, as I said, I, I, I started my postdoc uh, at, at, the, at the Pascal lab and at the time, uh, we were talk, thinking a lot about how the how the cortex how the, how the human cortex develops and uh, what are some of the ways that we can sort of come up with to really model some of the higher order phenomena that um, that really underlies human cortical assembly. Uh, and just to give you a brief overview of how the how the human cortex develops, um, this is a this is basically a, a representation of a developing human brain around. Uh, 19 to 20 post conception week. And if you take a cross section, this is sort of the cortical plate. Uh, and then this is divided into two different regions the dorsal forebrain and the ventral forebrain. Uh, and the dorsal forebrain is where the actual cortex uh, is generated and is where the glutamatergic cells are, 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 are born. Uh, on the other hand, the, in the ventral brain are, are Galbergi interneurons. Uh, that are generated early in development, but that have to migrate these long distances to reach eventually uh, where the glutamatergic cells are and synaptically integrate with them. And all of this happens mid to late, uh, starting early, but then sort of this assembly of the first circuits start happening around mid to late uh, gestational periods. Um, and, you, you know, this, this is basically... Um, uh, this this was the the two main uh, uh, let's say cellular phenomena that we were thinking about as we were thinking how okay how are we supposed how um, how do we go about really uh, generating a three dimensional model of some of these processes and the two processes we were thinking a lot about was the migration and the synaptic integration uh, and uh, long story short. We came up with this way of okay, why why don't we take a lesson from this development? There are these two regions that interact heavily, uh, these two forebrain regions, to so that the it, you know eventually giving rise to the cortex. Um, what then you know then the idea becomes why don't we generate these regions separately? Uh, the dorsal forebrain here in in blue, and then the ventral forebrain in in red, and put them together. And this is all to, to model some of these interregional interactions that eventually give rise to cortex. Uh, and then this was the first model that we came up with that the forebrain assemblies, we, we call them later, that really model some of these processes that I was telling about the migration and synaptic integration, uh, specifically of the human cortical interneurons into the glutamatergic networks. And so basically, what I want to do in the rest of the talk is give you sort of a brief historical perspective of how we developed this model. But I really want to spend a lot of time on the, the real utility of this model to us, which is the disease modeling. Uh, and you know, I'm going to talk a lot about this disorder called the Timothy syndrome, uh, uh, which is a very severe neurodevelopmental disorder, and how we use the assembly model to really understand first the, uh, these novel cellular phenotypes associated with human intraneural migration. And then how the assembly model really lends itself to uh, deep mechanistic studies uh, where we could go very deep into the molecular drivers of certain uh, 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 cellular phenotypes 
And, and then I'm going to end with uh, uh, is not, not just just the discovery phenotype discovery, but how how these discoveries can uh, help us take the ne next step. Just using these in vitro models to come up with some empirically guided uh, ther uh, therapeutic uh, avenues. Um, but let's start in the beginning. Um, the, in the beginning, even before cellular phenotype discovery was uh, to generate the model. And, and as I said, we were thinking about this in, uh, in uh, sort of the interaction of two separate regions that sort of give rise to this broader region, which is the cortex. Uh, and, you know, just, just one point, you know, I, I told you about the patterning mo molecules, right? And what these pattern molecules are, are either antagonists or agonists of, of signaling pathways that we know uh, uh, imprint, sort of instruct the, the emergence of, of this very specific regions during brain development. And uh, these signaling pathways are uh, activated by morphogens that are secreted from very specific regions called organizers in development. Um, and basically th these organizers by being you know you know diffusing through the tissue creates these gradients there are specific gradients uh, that along that gradient really pattern in very specific regions and for the cortex uh, it is basically these two regions called the cortical ham which secrete a lot of wind and then the the vent ventral center that secrete a lot of sonic hedgehog so we basically wanted to model this this interactions of wit and the sonic hedgehog to really get to this part of the, the uh, uh, forebrain that is that is the ventral. So ventral for us that was the, the real challenge because uh, uh, people still don't know why. But if you were if you are to if you were to leave uh, uh, these three dimensional cultures alone and just provide very minimal instructions for proliferation, basically, which F, Jeffy GF. They sort of assume this dorsal forebrain identity. This is sort of their default identity that they assume. Uh, so we, we don't have to do much there. But to ventralize this structure, we had to sort of uh, come up with a recipe to basically uh, block the wind so that we, we get down a little bit and then promote the sonic hedgehog. Uh, and this is IW we do and SAG that you're seeing here. Uh, so I'm going to spare you a, a lot of the details, but I'll say we've done a lot of trial and error. A lot of uh, uh, comparisons of various recipes and come up with one that generates uh, this um, project ventral progenitor pools uh, and the ventricular uh, like structures uh, in the in the subpallium recipe uh, along with later the gaborgic neurons. But then maybe this is a better representation of what what we're generating with the recipes uh, uh, where we did basically single cell and then we'll put these cells two cells together, and then uh, not much explanation needed here. You can see that the human cortical spheroids and the subpolyspheroids really separate out as the two principal clusters. And then within each of these clusters, we can see that the radial glia uh, in intermediate progenitors of glutamatergic neurons on the HCS side, and then the gabergic neurons, ventral progenitors, et cetera, on the uh, subpolyl side. And um, we basically, before we wanted to call this subpallium, we really wanted to make sure that this was really a subpallium-like spheroid. And to be able to do that, we had to really be convinced that we're not only generating a part of the subpallium. Subpallium has very different sort of subregions to it uh, that, uh, uh, that generate very different kinds of interneurons later in life. Uh, there are ganglionic eminences that are called the transient structures that are medial, caudal, lateral, MGC, GLG. And then there's also other sort of this nuclei that generate very specific kinds of cells. Uh, so basically we wanted to see if we sequence deeply enough, are we able to uncover some of these populations? And long story short, uh, we were able to see this, uh, this full complement basically of, of, of the subpalio cell diversity. Uh, in, in cells that we isolated uh, with this uh, interneural lineage marker and then sequenced deeply. Um, so at this point, we were uh, relatively convinced that we had a subpallial like uh, uh, steroid that we could sort of assemble with a cortex to really get after this question of, uh, you know, whether we can model 
uh, a human cortical assembly in a, in a dish. Uh, and for that, we basically, first thing we looked at was migration of interneurons. They have to migrate in order to integrate and then start this assembly process. Um, and then we basically infected the interneurons in the sphere uh, with uh, uh, with an in, this same DLX GFP interneuron marker, assembled it, and then tracked the, the migration of interneurons. And then you can see 30 days after assembly, there's a lot of interneurons that, that move, move forward uh, that infiltrate the, human, uh, the cortical spheroids. I'm going to skip this and then show you directly what this process looks like. Uh, again, this is uh, somewhere at, you know, uh, 20, 30 days after assembly, and you can see a lot of the cells um, that have infiltrated the cortex, but then you see also a lot of the cells that haven't. Uh, and we think that some of these other populations that are destined to go uh, to other places in subpallium, subpallium feeds interneurons to a lot of different proximal uh, regions as well, uh, uh, are, not, are not attracted to, by the cues that are uh, uh, you know, sort of secreted by the, by the cortex. Um, and we've done a lot of sort of legwork, uh, a lot of validation studies to show that this really happens like it, it does in terms of the kinetics of the migration, very similar to in vivo. We've done a lot of primary tissue validation experiments. We've shown that the, this very sort of specific mode of migration that they perform, which is sort of the saltatory mode of migration, really only happens in 3D environments. You cannot really recapitulate it that it, you know, to the setting. And most importantly, this is unidirectional. So if, if you were to put, for example, another subpallium, we've done this multiple control experiments where a subpallium fused with another subpallium spheroid, the, the migration, and then the only one side, side is labeled, the migration is really not all, not all that efficient. Uh, meaning that, you know, sort of implying that at least, uh, that there are cues specifically coming from the cortical spheroid side that sort of recapitulate some of the attractant cues that you would find in vivo. Uh, this is all in the very in the supplemental of this first paper, but I feel like they're very important points to make. Um, and again, at this point, we were sort of convinced that the migration happens as it should, but then the next step is what's going on after they migrated, which is equally important, if not more important uh, 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 question. Uh, and then the idea is that, are, you know, is a, the question is whether they're following their developmental trajectories, that once they're migrated, they're stopping, they're branching out, they're integrating into the local networks. Um, and then the first thing we looked at was morphology, and I'm gonna move through this relatively fast, that uh, we basically show that uh, the cells that have migrated over, they, they sort of increase in, in their dendritic complexity, they, they branch out. Um, uh, but then the most important thing was for us, whether they they're, they look like they're maybe sort of going through a, some, some kind of maturation process, but that whether they're sort of synaptically integrating into, into these networks. And uh, I'll walk you through this plus real, really quickly. Uh, what we did was basically from the three different groups, uh, we measured uh, mini excitatory uh, post uh, synaptic currents and mini inhibitory uh, post synaptic currents. Uh, and the three groups were just the subpallium that were not uh, uh, fused. Uh, subpallium, uh, the, the interneurons uh, in a subpallium that were not fused, interneurons in a subpallium that were fused but were not migrated. And the experimental group was the, the cells that have migrated over to the, to the cortical side. And, and then the first thing you'll see is that only in the experimental group that these interneurons are receiving this heavy excitatory postsynaptic input. Uh, and then we've done also the, the opposite. We looked at the excitatory cells once the interneurons have moved in, and only that in this green bar here, you can see that only in that condition that these cells start receiving this inhibitory postsynaptic input. Uh, and we also wanted to see if these cells going through uh, in, any kind of changes in their intrinsic properties, um, and maybe related to a maturation phase that they're going through. And, and then we basically looked at um, the, the generation of action potentials, and then we saw that the cells that have migrated over were firing twice as fast as, the, as their other counterparts. Uh, all of this done was Chris Mackinson, 
Ming knows or maybe some of you know also was an Emory grad uh, and now runs his lab at Columbia. Um, and so basically, um, to check the time. Oh, wow. how, how long do we have? Um, to, Twelve fifteen. Okay. Um, so at this point, we're sort of convinced that these two main processes that underlie particle assembly, the migration and the integration, we, we were able to model at a you know at a you know consistent enough level that we thought maybe we could now use this model to understand disease better. And you know uh, when I was thinking about what disease. This was this was one of the, uh, the, the uh, you know syndromes that that the Pascal lab had a lot of expertise on, and it's and it's indeed a very interesting uh, 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 syndrome. Uh, it's called Timothy syndrome, and then this is what we ended up uh, uh, using to to really and in, you know I, I will show you why this was the right choice. Uh, in that you know uh, I'll make the point now that the modeling this monogenic highly penetrant uh, uh, syndromes uh, proved to be the really a, a good first step in terms of showing how these models uh, can be can can be used to model disease. Uh, um, so basically, Timothy syndrome is uh, again this rare highly penetrant uh, disorder with a uh, bunch of uh, uh, neurological developmental e effects. Uh, and it's been it's been characterized heavily by uh, autism spectrum disorders and epilepsy, um, and uh, it is basically caused by this mutation in this gene called Cacnamon um, C, and the Cacnamon C what uh, encodes for the alpha uh, subunit of the alpha calcium channel CAV uh, 1.2, and what this mutation does it causes delayed inactivation of the channel, and you can see what what this looks like better here. That um, once the this is a voltage gated channel, so it opens by depolarization. Um, and in the this is uh, this is calcium current recordings, and then you can see in the controls. Once this channel opens by current injection, it closes relatively fast. Uh, you know you can see this decay curve here. But then in Timothy syndrome, this takes a lot longer. And you can see this phenotype just by doing calcium imaging with depolarization. Um, you, you can have just very high amounts of KCL. And you can see in the cortex, the channels close pretty fast, even, even though they're in KCL, but then in the, in the, in the TS that takes a lot longer. And, and just because of so, some of the reports indicating the role of calcium and activity in, in, in internal migration, we thought, okay, so this could be a good model for us to, to venture into, to really understand if this model can be used for disease modeling. Um, and then I'm, I'm just gonna uh, go relatively fast here uh, that we basically took uh, and generated four brain assembloids from three different patients. So these are patient-derived assembloids, stem cells that were generated from three Timothy syndrome patients. And from those cells, we generated these assembloids along with eight control cells, and then we compared their migration. The first thing we noticed that they were migrating very ineffectively. And then, um, when we looked a little bit closer and then try to tease out the uh, the phenotype, what we noticed that they were uh, moving, sort of the saltation frequency, number of saltations were higher, but then the distance that we're jumping was shorter. Um, so this was interesting. This was an interesting sort of a compound phenotype that we described. But then one thing, one question was, is, is what region was contributing to this phenotype, right? Uh, whether it's, it's the it's the sick cortex sort of causing the interneurons to move apparently in a cell non-autonomous matter, or maybe it's a cell intrinsic phenotype that is coming solely from the sick subpallial interneurons. And you can really address this question relatively easily uh, in a, in an informed assembly model by doing these hybrid assemblies, where you can put a Timothy syndrome subpallium, which is what we did here with a with a, a normal control cortex. And then you can really ask, in this case, we, we looked at migration and then he really told us that, yes, this was a an sort of intracell intrinsic phenotype. Um, and then we basically wanted to see whether this phenotype was caused by this overloading of calcium. So the channel is 
getting inactivated, uh, have the inactivation, you're getting a lot of calcium in. So if we block some of this, whether we can rescue um, the the some of the this uh, uh, phenotypes that we described, and we just use nimonipine, this L type calcium channel blocker. And um, what we saw was really interesting. It, it really robustly rescued the the part of the phenotype, the saltation length phenotype. But the saltation frequency was relative, you know, but basically practically undisturbed. So it it, it remained the same. Um, so basically, this was the point that we were uh, sort of described this early cellular phenotypes related to interneuron migration. But then we really wanted to challenge ourselves to see whether we can really figure out the molecular uh, 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 sort of drivers of this phenotype, uh, which we think is the real promise of, of these models that if you can really tease out a molecular atlas, disease atlas, uh, you can find particular pathways that are maybe more drug amenable than the others for a particular disease that might not be uh, obvious at, at first sight. Um, and then this was sort of like the main goal of this second story that we worked on. Um, but I'm going to, uh, yeah, we have time. Um, so basically this in this, you know, second story started with this idea that, okay, so we have a, a acute a calcium modulation pharmacologically to an imodipine that is rescue using part of the phenotype. So we have we probably this, this two bimodal uh, uh, disease phenotypes that we thought maybe are driven by two distinct molecular drivers. Um, but before going into that, we thought, okay, maybe if we watch these cells closely enough, it will tell us something that we haven't seen before. We had this massive amounts of imaging data sets. And then we said, okay, why don't we take a closer look? And the way that we did, did that was uh, tracking this, this in, internal neurons that they're migrating and the tracking very specific subcellular regions uh, during this migration. And, and then for this, we did this markerless subcellular tracking. This is deep lab cut. Some of you uh, might know what this is. This is a People use this for animal behavior studies. Uh, it's an algorithm that people use to track digits and uh, different parts of the animal to, doing behavior. And we implemented that to this imaging data sets to track things like growth cones, soma frowns, soma. And then it did a relatively good job um, uh, across the board, basically. But then we did, decided to focus on the saltation itself, the nucleokinesis event. And then for that, we basically tracked the front and the rear of the soma separately. And what this told us that in the controls, basically you have, a, this is a part, uh, one jump, that the rear and the back just moving forward at the same time. But in the Timmins syndrome, this is something that we hadn't noticed before, is that the rear of the cell was lagging behind. So you can see that the front moves ahead, but the, the, the rear is like behind. And then we basically measured this by these correlations of the front and the back. And what this told us immediately is that there's a contractility deficit. Uh, and the contractility machinery, basically cell rear uh, during a jump, really contracts to push the, the soma forward. And then once, once we saw that it was pulling forward, but unable to uh, push, push forward, uh, we thought that this, was, this machinery was the machinery that was uh, uh, perturbed maybe. And this is that actomycin contractility machinery, the same machinery that helps the heart contract, which is also calcium dependent. Um, and then we saw that it was really enriched at the rear of the soma uh, by, by standing for this phospho-MLC uh, marker. Uh, we saw that in TS, there were, there were uh, a, a lot more of this phospho-MLC signal, meaning that yes, they're probably sort of hyperphosphorylated and this pathway is over-engaged. Uh, and then when we block this pathway basically a little bit, uh, what we saw was the exact same phenotype we saw by when we uh, inhibited using acutely with the L-type calcium channel blockers. Uh, the saltation length rescue, nothing happening with the frequency. And it, so what this told us is that there's an acute effect of calcium overloading of the cell right on this uh, actomyosin pathway. And this is what's causing, causing this um, saltation length phenotype. But we still had no idea what was happening with the saltation frequency. Um, and for this, we basically went ahead and did like an unbiased screening of various time points. We did basically RNA sequencing of a lot of different samples. 
And I'm gonna spare you the gory details here. And I'm just gonna point out two things. Uh, and uh, basically when we did this G G the gene site enrichment analysis in Timothy syndrome, there were two terms that really caught our attention. Uh, this regulation of membrane potential and synaptic transmission of Galbergic cells. We did not really expect this. Uh, so we thought, okay, is this just noise coming from, from, the, from the transcriptomic signal or is this real? So we just wanted to see. Uh, the, so the first thing we checked was um, the membrane potential, basically patch clamp and looked at various capacitance input resistance. And then well, these are the basically actively migrating cells that we passed. Uh, and then we saw that these interneurons were really relatively uh, depolarized uh, compared to the controls. So yes, we did we did have an, a, a, a phenotype related to the membrane potential. Uh, and then when the, what we did with the gabergic cells, so we basically gabergic signal, we saw a lot of the receptors that were upregulated uh, in, in the differentially expressed uh, genes. And then what we thought was, okay, maybe there's an overexpression of the GABA receptors, uh, and which would mean that and, and has a sensitivity to GABA. Uh, and then the, to, to assay that, we did a very simple experiment. We basically uh, patched interneurons derived from control or uh, TS sub pallium, and then looked at the GABA sensitivity. And then what we saw was that, yes, in TS, we were getting this, this, this uh, GABA induced currents at a much higher level uh, than the controls. Um, so this, this took us to discover uh, signaling uh, a part of the story that we didn't expect to see, but that, okay, we, we, not, we knew that GABA is involved, is a pro migratory signal. So we basically followed up on that and asked, you know, this is probably, might this be what really regulates the frequency? And this was indeed the case. So when we blocked some of this uh, GABA receptors, we were able to bring down the saltation frequency and uh, with no effect on the saltation length. So I went into a lot of details about migration and a little bit of a maybe overkill, you might think. Uh, it's like, why go so deeply in into why a migration phenotype happens that it, the, the way that it happens? But I just wanted to highlight the fact that, you know, using this model where we could really dissect the phenotype being cell intrinsic, acute, and then the downstream pathways that are affected acutely, uh, but then having another part of it being more of a chronic uh, 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 phenotype where gene expression pathway is likely uh, overactivated uh, through the this uh, calcium signals, which we know induce a lot of the activity dependent pathways, uh, increasing discovery receptors and modulating yet another part of this phenotype. And, uh, you know, we think this is an important point to make because uh, just like migration, there's probably a lot of other phenotypes that could be sort of dissected out this way, where you can think, okay, maybe if, I'm, if I were to think, uh, develop a drug, uh, this could be the first side of, of, of what I would want to target. You know, the L-type calcium channel, that's where the primary pathology is, so I need to target the L-type calcium channels. But what this something like this tells you that there's yet another uh, uh, phenotype that, that could really be targeted that maybe sort of circumvents that uh, L5 calcium channel and then really modulates the part of the phenotype that would, you know, if you had a lack of interneurons, that would, this would probably explain why the, the, the saltation frequency or like a misplacement of, uh, of interneurons. So you're able to really target very specific parts of a phenotype and we think this is really sort of like the promise of models like this. Um, but before I finish, um, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about an un unpublished story. So sort of this brings this trilogy of Thymus syndrome to an end for us, at least for me, um, that you know we went from cellular to molecular, and now we're thinking a little bit about, okay, what are some of the therapeutic targets that we can identify? Uh, using some of the some of the findings that we've described in the past years, um, and and for that I'm going to tell you something that I haven't told uh, you yet uh, about Timothy syndrome, is that um, 
So this is, if, if you look at the gene cut now and see where the Timmel syndrome mutation is, uh, there are two main uh, isoforms that are enriched in, in development in adulthood, et cetera. There are many others, but these are the two of the, the main ones. Um, this is the isoform 8A that has the exon 8A, uh, and then the isoform 8 that has the alternative splice. Uh, okay, so this is mislabeled here, but, but you see what I mean. So the isoform 8A here, and then the alternative is, they both say 8A? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so sorry. Uh, yeah, anyway, so this, this is, the, the diagram is right though. So this is uh, either the exon 8 or the alternative splice exon 8A. Um, and basically the point is, is that during development, uh, you get enrichment of exon 8A initially. And uh, this is this is mouse data, but it holds up relatively well in humans and spheroids, et cetera, that around birth, there's this very uh, uh, stark switch to exon 8 uh, isoform. Um, and what I haven't taught you is that the, the, uh, the TS syndrome, the TS uh, mutation uh, is rests on this exon 8A, alternative splice exon 8A. And on top of that, what this mutation does, not only causes this calcium specific uh, phenotype, but it really inhibits the switching of these isoforms. It inhibits this developmental switch going from 8A to 8, so that you have this pathological uh, TS mutation harboring uh, isoform really persisting all throughout the output. Uh, and this is an example from spheroids, some polyspheroids, that this is a ratio between eight and N8. So if it's above this line, it's N rich in eight. And you see at earlier time points, you have more of the 8A uh, and then this sort of like dips down uh, uh, as, as you get older and older. Albeit this in vitro, but this has been shown in other models, it's, it's pretty consistent. So we asked a very simple question is that, can we induce this 8A to a change in Timothy syndrome. And if we can, does this induce, you know, the downstream, the rescue of some of the cellular phenotypes that, that we've described that are uh, TS specific. Um, and for that, we, we took an, an uh, ASO approach. ASOs are antisense oligonucleotides. Maybe some of you have heard of these before. These are this uh, very short uh, uh, 20 mer, 15 mer uh, oligos that have been in development for uh, maybe decades now um, uh, and, and very recently have been used in, in uh, a lot of this uh, therapeutics targeting various things. Uh, in, 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 you know, these are this is basically, you don't have to read, but these are all the clinical trials that, uh, that use ASO uh, targeting uh, various different things in SMA, in Hunt, Huntington's, uh, uh, in Duchenne's, and, and things like in, in neurodegenerative diseases like that. And what these ASOs do is they really do various different things depending on the, the, the chemistry. They can degrade, uh, degradate uh, uh, target mRNAs, they can RS translation. Uh, but for us, what we focused on is the chemistry that would modulate splicing. So what we did was basically this ASOVOLC approach, we generated a bunch of ASOs with the splicing modulation chemistry. And then we walked this part of the Kantna 1C that has the, the 8A and 8 uh, in the Timothy syndrome. But basically the muta TS mutation is here. And you can see these are all the ASOs that we designed to cover that space. And then we asked a very simple question, basically. We know that in TS, 8A is enriched. Uh, can we induce the enrichment of 8 over, over 8A in Timothy syndrome. Uh, and then you can see here is that, you know, as we start the walk, there are some candidates that are very robustly inducing this, this change. So we are really enriching 8, 8 over A, 8 over 8A uh, in, in Timothy syndrome. This was very surprising for us. I'm very pleasantly surprised by this. Uh, but then we really wanted to see if we're able to rescue the actual cellular phenotypes and the core cellular phenotype being the inactivation. Um, and then I want just I keep the suspense just to say that yes, yes, we can actually uh, rescue this delayed inactivation both in, in the calcium imaging uh, experiments 
you can see that in here in blue that classic uh, uh, decay um, slow decay and then it's rescued in purple in exos and then here in the calcium current recordings it's this pretty much looks exactly like the like the control um, and basically just to come full circle we looked at whether we can rescue migration and and this seems to be the case so we basically added this asos um and, and then for about two weeks so we we add it once and then we we wait for two weeks so this is a single dose aso um and and that's just by itself enough to to in, rescue this the the you know the number of saltations and the average saltation length um in the in timothy syndrome so we've done a lot more work on this including in vivo work where we transplanted this ts spheres and then we've We've done sort of, uh, uh, you know, try to, to, to do an in vitro, in vivo hybrid rescue of certain things that you wouldn't be able to do in, in an in vitro setting. Um, but hopefully, um, I'll be able to talk about that probably next time. Um, but so, yeah, it's, this was a bit of a, let me see how much time I have. Okay. Um, bit of a fast overview of, starting from the rationale as to why develop these models, how to develop these models, um, and, uh, and the disease modeling that, and the depth of disease modeling, the breadth of insights, both biological and disease related, you can gather from, from these human brain -based, uh, organoid based models. Um, and so I wanna finish here by highlighting, so I talk a lot about my postdoctoral work uh, I, I opened up my lab as, as Ming said in February this year. And um, uh, yeah, I, we sort of continue this tradition of developing these models uh, with, with disease in mind and through the perspective of this very multidisciplinary uh, set of tools that we're bringing and trying to implement uh, uh, to this in, to this in vitro models. Uh, and I'm going to just highlight, just rapid fire some of the interests that we, some of the questions that we're currently thinking about, and I'm happy, happy to talk more about any of this uh, later on. Um, so I showed you a lot about the cellular changes that spe specifically interneurons go through, uh, showing you that they go through morphological changes, uh, physiological changes. Uh, now what we're really interested in is understanding what are the molecular Right, so we that's sort of in the tradition of understanding the cellular and going deeper into molecular, and this is really what we want to do uh, uh, now to understand what are the some of the molecular mechanisms that drive this maturation and early connectivity uh, in vitro, uh, specifically focus on this activity dependent uh, uh, pathways, because we know that these interneurons, they themselves exhibit a lot of activity. They move into these early cortical networks that are very rich in activity. And we know these activity-dependent programs are constantly driving certain uh, aspects of, of development. We really want to tease this out in a, at a cell-type specific level. Um, we're really interested in this isoform landscape. I think this case study of CACNA1C was very illuminating for me, at least. Uh, in, in, in that there are a lot of these isoforms that very dynamically and very starkly switch uh, uh, do, during the course of the, the development. And we really know very little uh, as to what the functional consequences of some of the switches are. And that remains also true for cacna one c I didn't mention that, but uh, there's a switch normally that happens if you forget about TS in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in healthy individuals, we still don't know why the switch happens and what the functional consequences are. So we're really interested in sort of teasing out, you know, things like cat one c and, and other genes, the, the really the contribution of different isoforms to, to development. Uh, and then we're developing novel models that incorporate some of the interactions that uh, we do not have currently in the forbidden models. For example, neuromodulatory input. We know things like serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, these neuromodulators come in really early to the cortex uh, and do a lot of a lot of different things that that we do we don't we do not currently model in the in the forbidden assemblies. So we're very excited to bring those into the mix and see what what they really do uh, um, uh, in vitro as well. 
And if is and we're also interested in sort of like revisiting these very fundamental questions about brain development. Um, uh, for example, how does complexity emerges? How does tissue? Uh, what are the drivers of tissue morphogenesis during, during brain development? But now this time through the lens of uh, human brain development and through the lens of uh, uh, implementing some of these newer technologies that enable us to really tease out uh, some of the signaling associated with emergence of different regions, emergence of different cell types. Uh, and, and here we, we're very excited about this, this avenue we're pursuing right now that using this DNA memory uh, recorders that, that they call it now, we can imprint, we can encode, we can basically read out the signaling histories of each of these cells as, as this, this specification events happen uh, in vitro. Uh, and um, I, I think this will tell us a lot about some of the principles that are latent, that are hidden in the in, in, the in vitro models that, uh, um, uh, that are really recapitulating some of these early principles uh, of development. Um, and again, so all of this with disease in mind and one of the disease angles that we're thinking a lot about is convergence. This is a hot new topic in, uh, in neurodevelopmental disorders that now there's like a, a big explosion of genes that we know all about, right? There's like these huge studies that came up with, that, that come up with genes of, for autism, epilepsy, et cetera, all the time. Uh, and now people are sort of uh, have this huge list that are iron channels, transcription factors, uh, et cetera, that are of different functions. Uh, and one big question is that, where do these uh, genes converge? Uh, do they converge? You know, they, they're supposedly performing different functions, but uh, the question is how, how are they sort of implicated for the same disease in spite of having seemingly different functions? Um, and, you know, on the other uh, side, we're also looking into the same gene, different mutations, different indications of so the same gene, like TCF4, depending on the mutation it gets, it can lead to very different kinds of disorders. So th these are the, the questions of convergence that we're using a lot of these models that we've, we're developing to, to really understand the levels of convergence uh, in, in, in disorders, uh, and and basically maybe in the mutations that that sort of uh, lead to different kinds of disorders as well. Um, yeah, and I will I will end here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't have anything else. I'll just leave this here. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, happy to take any questions. Um, I'd like to start with a question um, and a reminder to everyone to raise your hand and have a, a mic delivered to you for questions. Um, and so I was um, curious about um, this Timothy syndrome model that you presented and, you know, there were these migration deficits that you showed. And I'm curious about some of the functional implications, say, of these migration deficits. So, for example, if there's fewer inner neurons in the cortex, then maybe there's an EI problem, but then you showed some data where you said, well, actually, these GABAergic cells are even more excitable. Um, yeah. So I, I'm just curious if you could if you could talk about some of those. Yeah. Um, let me just pull out one more slide here. So this is something that, that we, we try to get after. Uh, we want to see what are the migrated TS internals, what, what do they look like in this forbidden assembloids? And um, you know, they're they're moving more. Does that mean that they're they're sort of integrating less because they have a hard time stopping and th things of that nature? Uh, I mean, one finding that we had was that these cells were actually hyper excitable. Um, and you know, another thing that we looked at was this cortical networks that just if, if you were to do calcium imaging, not on the internet, you let the internals migrate, but then you're imaging the, the, the excitatory cells. Uh, here you see more of this hypersynchronous like global events in, in Timothy syndrome. So yeah, I think I think it's it's sort of hard to tease out the contribution like with the set of experiments that we did, uh, sort of linking the migration to the to the some of the later later uh, phenomena that that you might see because 
you know, the cortical interneurons, the cortical excitatory neurons themselves also have certain phenotypes to sort of uh, occlude that, maybe preclude that a little bit. So maybe in combination of a bunch of other hybrid assembloids where you're looking at, you're doing these assays, but in different configurations of assembloids could help answer that. Um, but yeah, yeah, this is sort of where we end up with this story, yeah. Um, great talk, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, how do you know that the deficit you identified is the key deficit? So you, you did beautiful work, you've come up with therapeutic, but how do you know that's the thing that you actually are, is gonna solve the, the clinical problem that these people have? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think for, for therapeutic syndrome, I think we are, so confident it's a monogenic syndrome. We know where the pathology starts. It's, we know where the mutation is. Uh, and sort of we're sort of like taking refuge in that a little bit that if we were to uh, rescue it at that level where we know where, where it originates from, um, it was sort of like trickle down and, and rescue some of the downstream effects. Now, um, that might not be true for that might be true for certain things, might not be true for other things. We know that there's a lot of gene expression changes. There may be a lot of adaptation that happens before we can introduce this, if it's an ASO, that we're introducing this ASO. Um, but you know, I think it, it remains to be seen uh, what you know we need to really, if, if if we were to pursue this, I think we really need to tease out. Uh, you know, the, the point at which each of these phenotypes start emerging. Uh, and, you know, if we were to rescue it in an in afterbirth, um, would it be enough to rescue like the interneural migration after after birth or already the EI imbalances due to the, you know, sort of like, you know, my, migration deficits already in place. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think this is these are these are all good questions. Also begs the question when to introduce and uh, the, the therapeutic like this. Uh, we really have to understand like very specific dynamics. We basically need to go very granular with, with a lot of a lot of these things uh, and incorporate as as much of the in vivo work as we can. There's not not a, an animal model of, of TS unfortunately. Uh, but through these transplantation studies, I think we can get after a lot of this question. All right, I know a lot of you guys have, um, have to go, but if you have any other questions, then please feel free to approach the podium afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you.